everybody, and welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron this week, The Comic Noob Show. Hey, Comic Noobs, thank you very much. Some old friends from our patron. Yes. Tony has the bad idea for this week. Tony, what are we talking about? We are going to be talking about the video game Star Citizen. And this was suggested by Joe, who is the boss over here at Human Echoes. And it's one of those things where there's a slight chance this won't become a bad idea. So we might be jumping the gun a little bit, but we're going to detail why I think that this is a bad idea now. It's ongoing. It's currently bad for people who want to do the Star Citizen thing. I will say right up front that I also... I don't own this game. I don't have any stock in this game, but I have been aware of the unfolding of this bad idea peripherally so much so that I kind of assumed it had passed that either it definitely hadn't come out and was just dead or it definitely had come out and I just hadn't heard about it because it was a dud. Now this thing is still very much supposedly quote unquote in development. They uh, just two weeks ago put out a new $3,000 ship that you can buy. But the, you, the game is still not done. You can buy... I, I want to let you start, Tony, but you just said in on, for a game that you can't really play, you can spend $3,000 to own a thing that does not exist. Yes, exactly. Star Citizen is the largest crowdfunding endeavor for a game ever taken on. It's a dream that started in 2012 when Kickstarters were just starting to be a major way for companies to quickly raise cash. The game itself was promised to be one of the deepest space sims of all time, and would include elements from MMORPGs such as World of Warcraft, its multi-massive online role-playing games, single-player campaigns, battle arenas, racing games, and so much more. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be released in 2014, and the game is currently not out of its very early alpha testing after raising nearly $300 million. Yowza. So you can kind of play it now. Yes, you can go in there and you can do sort of like a, a first-person shooter type thing. You can do a separate game, which is like racing, so you can actually test out some of the starships that you bought. Uh, there's a few game modes that are out there. Okay. But we're going to get into how much smaller this is compared to what's been promised. The game, which honestly is stunningly pretty in developer videos and demos, was supposed to be everything a sci-fi nerd could dream of. It was supposed to have a player-driven economy, a gray market where discoveries and far-off systems could be worth real-life money, a deep combat system where up to 80 people could be taking up stations on a single ship, a single ship that would cost you $1,500 to $3,000 to have in this game. These pledge ships would start to become a trend, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. Okay, uh, you've named off a lot of features, Tony, but I think the question on everybody's lips, the thing we need to know before we ourselves go and invest money in this is, will there be Battle Royale? There's a sort of Battle Royale system that they have right now with the first-person shooter and in the like online combat simulator where you can like fly the ships around and shoot at everybody. So they have something similar, and I wouldn't be surprised if they just decide to tack on, like, oh, we have a full-on real Battle Royale system like Fortnite. Okay. Okay. With everything else they add, that would be the least surprising thing I've ever heard. The game didn't quite start in such a sprawling manner. In 2012, they had hoped to raise around $500,000 so that a small team of devs could get their space sim off the ground. Now, how many fake ships will that buy, Tony? That 500000 It's like about twenty. It depends on the ships you're buying. You could buy a lot of the $10 ones. By the end of their Kickstarter, they had raised $2.1 million on the actual Kickstarter site and a few million more on their own site because they actually were trying to do a uh, fundraiser where they didn't have to give a cut to Kickstarter. But after the their servers crashed, they had to kind of do a little bit of both. The site raised an additional $2 million and the company was sitting pretty at around $5 million when everything was sorted out. The project is being headed up by Chris Roberts, a noticed game developer who has been making games since the 80s. His first massive success was Wing Commander, which hit consoles and PCs in 1990 and was considered absolutely incredible at the time. Chris Roberts being at the head is why this main site is not called Star Citizen, but is rather under the name Roberts Space Industries. 
It's being published by another company called Cloud Imperium Games, but really they are all the same people. Did this guy also work on Duke Nukem Forever? Because you'd think he would have learned something. No, he experience. did not, but he probably should have. When Duke Nukem Forever was being made, he switched over to making movies and made a lot of major flops, but also created one of the best Nicolas Cage movies ever in Lord of War. Uh, Yeah, okay. But he also made a bunch of movies like Who's Your Caddy and so on that did very, very poorly. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, with a name like Who's Your Caddy, did he spend a lot on it? Because it's okay if it's bad on purpose. I didn't go too deep into Who's Your Caddy, in all honesty. <laughs> well, and we're all the poorer for it. This actually wouldn't be the first time that Chris Roberts promised a massive amount of features for a space sim either. He developed a game called Freelancer that was delayed for many years. Although this one, when it was finally released, contained only a portion of what was promised, but was mostly well-liked by players and critics. Metacritic at the time gave it about an 80, and it was a solid game with good controls and was pretty fun. The development would happen in what was considered a module format for Star Citizen, in which they would put each aspect of the game into its own small module so they could test it, work out the bugs, and combine it into a larger game later. The first was the Hangar Mode, which came out in 2013, where you could go and look at the ships you purchased. You could climb in them and do some minor decorating, do a lot of other things. And the reason why people started getting more hyped and why this went from like 5 million to what it is now is because there are some incredible aspects of these ships. Like every little thing you can think of, you can interact with and change. Like whenever you're in a cockpit, the controls are all over the place. You actually have to learn how like every little thing on your ship works. Like where's the the button that turns like the, the ramp on the back of it open? Like all these different things that you can control. It's all well done in the cockpit. Like that's one of the coolest aspects of this game from uh, the times that I've gotten to play it. So, are you just clicking on buttons and switches, trying to figure out what they do? Like, or, or are well, they, they mapped they to keyboard keys? They they highlight it in the game mode. You would absolutely hate that there's not keyboard shortcuts, and the way you actually interact with things, you don't like look at something and hit E. You actually have to hit F, hold it down, and wait for the menu to pop up. Then you select what you do with that little switch. So uh. it's a little clunky there. Like I could see you just absolutely not even be like it would be unplayable for you. I don't like the lack of keyboard shortcuts, it's true. I, I'm sure that they probably have something now, but I didn't dig into the keyboard shortcuts because my game time was limited. And this was released in 2013 and allowed a lot of backers to breathe a sigh of relief by actually being able to see the ships that they had purchased in the game. The next was the Arena Commander, a sort of battle arena and racing area where players could take their ships and their first flights and fight with other players. The frame rate looked about like a PowerPoint presentation and the controls were pretty wonky. But it was a very early development thing, and it gave people more hope for how the combat system would actually turn out later. After this, they made a module called Star Marine, which was a module to contain the first-person shooter aspect of the game. They outsourced this to a company called Illphonics, who developed it to the best of their ability. Unfortunately, due to communication issues with Illphonics, they were building maps to the wrong scale, the art didn't quite match up, and a lot of other things started to go wrong. And then in the middle of development, they decided to change the game engine so that it would allow uh, Linux players to play. And they decided to fire Ilphonics instead of letting them redevelop it for this system. They canceled Star Marine for a little while, but then brought it back, and now it's a first-person shooter that you can still play. And they're hoping that this is a big part of the, ma the main game later, so that you have, like, space combat, you have on-the-ground combat, you've got all these different ways of playing, depending on what you actually like doing. As well as the cool ideas of being able to, like, force dock onto another player's ship and go through it and basically fight Space Hulk action. So, you're saying it's a game that's been in, develop for, in development for a stupidly long time... They changed the engine they're developing for in the middle of the development cycle, and none of these people worked on Duke Nukem 3D. None of them. Like, they were using the Cry engine, which is not something Duke Nukem used, and now they're on, like, this weird free Amazon system. No, but Duke, system. if you recall from our episode oh, I definitely on Duke recall. Nukem 3D, they definitely did decide to switch in the middle of producing they... and just used, had to create all new assets, and I'm just getting flashbacks. I'm just... No, yep. believe me, whenever I was reading this, I was like, this is exactly what happened with Duke Nukem. I mean, how long did it take? 13 years for Duke Nukem Forever? Yes. Something around that? Like, we're at seven years right now for this. They say the first year doesn't count, otherwise it would be eight, because that was just a proof of concept. The difference here is that we're in the weird partial release beta world. Alpha. where they, uh, They've yeah. never uttered the word beta. 
Like okay. everything is alpha right now. I, I this is just my limited vocabulary here. Whatever <laughs> model it is where people release their game in pieces before the game is actually released, at least Duke Nukem, at least Duke Nukem when it came out was the whole game that they made. You didn't get like here's a model of the Duke that you can have on your desk and here's one level you can play and. Here's what a gun might look like. It was, yeah. it was all the For game. For $15, you can purchase this particular gun that you might be able to play with Duke later. I bet they would have had, like, at that point, if they were doing that now, they would have, like, the $15 topless DLC. It's like, <laughs> all, the, all the enemies are topless hot ladies instead of just the strippers. That actually sounds exactly like they, what they would do to, in today's market. The next mode is the one I was the most excited about, the universe mode. This was set to be a major draw for a giant living universe with hundreds of systems to explore at launch and near infinite amount later things to procedurally generated planets. Like that game that also had a wonderful launch called No Man's Sky. I was about to say, I've heard of this game when it was called No Man's Sky and it wasn't well received <laughs> there either. Yeah, but the difference is No Man's Sky actually released. And they actually built a game that turned out to be pretty good and actually has a pretty thriving community built around it now because they added in a bunch of the features that people were hoping for. So I've heard. This was where you were supposed to be able to see entire fleets of players in formation trying to control territories, explore, mine, and just generally live like that hard sci-fi life. And this is what I've been wanting from a game for ages. Like, I've wanted to see that space sim that was so deep that you could just, like, you could literally feel like you were part of, like, The Expanse or part of Star Trek or something like that. And that's that's what they were hoping to release. I think there's a difference in having a world that you identify with in some way and having every single detail being accurate to how it would quote-unquote really be. I mean, people love the Fallout games to a certain extent, but they're still, like, games? Yeah, you, know? you still have stim packs, you still have, like, all these other things that are sort of magic, so you don't have to get bogged down in a three-week healing session for whenever you took, like, some frag grenade, like, parts to your middle. Yeah, one of the things I think people... And maybe I'm wrong about this. There's all kinds of different people who like different kinds of games these days, but I don't know that the general public is crying out for more details in their video games as far as how things operate. I've been back playing the original Doom on my Switch because they released it on the Switch. And I, believe you me, there is no part of me that thinks, man, if only I had to reload these weapons <laughs> in the middle of these fights, that would really make this game a better game. It, it, that's just not there. Well, like, the thing is, you could get as tedious as you want in this, or you can take some of the shortcuts. Like, you can go up to the cockpit and be like, enter cockpit, or you can do lower ladder, like, climb door, enter seat, close hatch, all these other, like, things. You can make it, like, a 12-step process if you want. And, like I said, this is where I've actually played the game. And whenever you wake up in this space station, and you go around, and you see these NPCs, and it looks fantastic, and you climb into your spaceship for the first time, you walk past the bunks that are in there, you see how the weapon systems work, you see how responsive everything is, you can understand how much detail they're putting into this game. But whenever you have so much detail that it's never going to be released, that's a problem. Also, the fact that the bugs are so insanely bad. Like, getting to my ship, I fell through the world and died like three separate times. Because, like, I just, like, fell through a platform, or, like, got caught in a thing, or a door would open and it was a black void to nothing. Like, there's just so many weird, wonky little things that happen, and that's not even half of what I've seen online for some of this stuff. Like, they added an incredibly detailed city with, like, a working train system that you have to, like, wait for it to show up, and all these other things where... Like, everything is done in real time, and it's meant to be the coolest, like, type of simulator that you can be in, and some of it's absolutely beautiful, and the ships are big enough that you can literally get lost in them trying to figure out, like, alright, I'm on, like, deck four, and, like, I've got to get up to this next area, and there's so many cool things about it. It even has, like, a weird thing where you're tracking, it's tracking your facial expressions in real time so that other people can see the expression on your character's face while you're looking at them. Like, there's a ton of detail that's just completely outlandishly, like, incredible. But this is what led to the feature creep and why it's probably never going to be released. Yep. You gotta pick something to put out, guys. 
The final game mode in this is the single player mode called Squadron 42, which is this, their single player story mode. They went all out hiring major actors for this, finding people like Gary Oldman, Mark Hamill, Jillian Anderson, Andy Serkis, and more. Cloud Imperium said that this game would offer a minimum of 20 hours of core gameplay with tons of side quests, and they are already planning the next two sequels. For Roberts, this is his spiritual successor to Wing Commander. This is the game I want to play, I think. See, I, like, I'm fine with the single-player aspect, but I want that giant world. But they're, like, I could see this being fun, but like because they're so divided, they're, we're not getting any of it. Yeah, it, they put one of these things out. Either put Minecraft in space out with lots of graphics, right? Because that's what the other thing seems like. Kind of. I guess there's not really mining and stuff, or is there? There is mining. Well, supposedly. Okay. Like, they're saying that Eventually they're making it complicated so you don't just hit a thing and actually mine. You have to, like, do some complicated maneuvers to, like, mine an asteroid. You can buy plots of lands on planet and build whatever you want there, supposedly, but we haven't seen exactly what you can do, but it costs $100 per plot. Things like that. But this, this other thing where they're just like, also, we have sort of the new version of Wing Commander. Like, why didn't you just make that? You could have made so much money and we wouldn't be talking about you right now unless you did something else stupid. Yeah, well, the thing is, if they launched, if they got Squadron 42 working, like, if they just focused on that, and then they're like, oh, man, you know how much you love that Squadron 42 game? Now we have the giant open world thing that was based off of that. Like, just get it streamlined and done for that game and, like, put out the, like, the other stuff later. That's what, that's what they should be doing. But that's not what, not, not what's happening. And I just want to take a moment to remind you that the Squadron 42 game was supposed to be fully launched in 2014. Like, entirely. We're not still in 2014, right, Tony? This is a this is a different... This is later than that? Just checking. Okay. Considering that this was during the first term of the Obama administration, that's how far removed we are from this. Okay. They claim to have a tentative date of second quarter 2020, and that is for the single-player version. I have for very little For 20 hours faith. of gameplay, by the way, which... Is okay, but it's not that many hours of gameplay. At this point, the staff grew from dozens to well over 200 people. Everything from YouTube editors and film crews that put out two to three videos per week, to linguists to design alien languages, coders, artists, and more in studios across the world. Like, there's some in Austin, there's some in uh, Santa Monica, there's quite a few in Germany. Like, there's a lot of different studios that are handling different aspects of this game. This also doesn't include the substantial amount of work that is outsourced to other companies. As of the most recent article, there are up to 537 people working on this game full-time. It's not out. No, and not even close. Like, not even remotely close to out. AAA titles such as Grand Theft Auto have been known to have much larger staffs, but they also have a history of actually publishing their games and reaping massive benefits. Like GTA 5, GTA 4, Red Dead Redemption, all these other ones with these giant staffs have put something together and actually released it. God of War was Santa Monica Studios, and they had a couple hundred people at one point. And they focused in, they knew what they wanted to do, and they put it out. Like, this is just so substantially large that with 500 people, they're not able to get simple features working. Like I said, I was falling through the world over and over and over again. I was watching as... The game kept crashing for a guy online, and every time he was just trying to get to one place, and it took over a half hour of space jumps and, like, hyperspace and everything just to get his ship to this area for it to crash immediately when he was trying to land. And not crash, like, crash into the ground with his ship in a very realistic manner. You mean, like, blue screen of death, the game clipped out or something? Let's call it both, because both of those happened. Oh, okay. Okay. There was a pretty funny moment where he for he was flying into the city and he forgot uh, which button was to open the communicator so that he could request a landing and he was shot out of the sky. It's like, that's some attention to detail right there. But again, it doesn't sound like a game. It just sounds like me trying to, you know, park somewhere <laughs> and forgetting what button turns the AC on in my van because it's a terrible design and... Man, if I could do an episode about the the dashboard of the Honda Odyssey that I own and bad ideas, this is a digression, <laughs> Tony. This is a bad dashboard. None of the buttons make any sense. Good van otherwise. But it doesn't sound like a game. And it, to me, it doesn't sound like they know what they will actually want to do. It sounds like yeah. there's about five different ideas here that are all trying to live in the same game. And yeah, there's not... five overarching ideas with, like, 500 subcategories to each one of those ideas. 
Right, you have to pick one. You have to know what you're going to do and then go do it. You can't do all the things. Yeah. You have to do a thing. Like, if you really want to do something well, you need to do just that thing, not 18 other things that kind of seem like you maybe could do them. That's my take on this anyway. No, I, th I believe that you have, like, you've entirely figured it out. You should go work for them. <laughs> I'll solve your problem. <laughs> Hire me today, and I will tell you to stop doing things, <laughs> and you will win. Or you could just read the book Essentialism. It's a good book. In 2015, The Escape has put an article out saying that former employees had started to leak information about toxic work environments, a distinct lack of vision on how to accomplish their goals, and much more. It was also stated that they had already spent 82 of their then $90 million total raised in making an unplayable game. Other controversies started and said that the VP of the company, Sandy Gardner, and the wife of Chris Roberts, that she was extremely hostile to employees, used lots of racial epithets, used a lot of inappropriate language in internal memoirs, and basically berated and belittled her employees constantly. She's going to get that blood test out, though, Tony, and that's the important thing. <laughs> Theranos reference there. <laughs> it's the Bad Ideas Hit Parade. They're just all here. This is sort of something that's that might not be 100% substantial, because Cloud Imperium was quick to strike back, claiming none of this happened, that it was a smear campaign, and their legal team would make sure the slander was po prosecuted. They essentially fake news the article. And... I would say this is about 50-50% true. The escapist reporter verified that these people had worked there based on an ID card. An ID card that was never issued to any employee at Cloud Imperium. Unfortunately, a lot of the damage had already been done that reinforced to many people that Star Citizen would become the most expensive piece of vaporware ever developed. It does seem like one of those easy targets that if you say, and they're also mistreating their employees, that people are fed up enough where they'd be like, yeah, they are, and you wouldn't actually have to Prove it. Forbes would later go on to interview about 30 former employees, and they all said very similar things about like the work environment just being completely scattered, chaotic, and that the guy who headed this up, Roberts, was completely a micromanager who would reject things over and over and over again. Like he would ask for revisions, then he would reject the revisions, tell him to roll it back, and then reject the rollback. So it's basically like none of this is getting done because there isn't any sort of decentralized command happening here. Man, none of these people, we want to remind you, worked on Duke Nukem forever. <laughs> the game continues to promise huge lofty goals and even hosts its own conventions called Citizen Con. These cons were used to highlight aspects of the roadmap, show new features and ships, and try to keep the donations coming in. Previously, I don't know if you want to use the word con <laughs> in your, anything related to this game until it's actually out. Previously, these had been free to stream events, but in 2018, they tried to charge $20 a person just to watch the event for a game that you cannot really play. When the fan base rebelled, they decided to make it free as per usual. People were just pretty enraged that after spending of thousands of dollars on a game, they have yet to see like any of these updates implemented. This is essentially the state of the game today. The article from Forbes said that this is not fraud. Roberts really is working on the game, but it is incompetence and mismanagement on a galactic scale. The article itself was titled The Saga of Star Citizen, a video game that raised $300 million but may never be ready to play. Yeah, you know, I gotta say, in hearing this, I never once did think, I bet they're cheating people. Yeah, like, it seems like they're just, like, they keep throwing more at the wall and, like... It's not It's not that they want to cheat people, it's that they just don't know how to finish. It's not malice, it's incompetence. Yes. It cites many different things that are flat out incomplete. They promised 100 star systems at launch, but have yet to entirely complete a single one. They have sold over 135 different varieties of ships, but only around 85 are actually in the game. The FTC is now fielding hundreds of complaints asking for refunds, and some of these singular complaints are running up to $24,000 of people buying ships. The article goes on to detail that the company is currently spending about $30 million per year on personnel alone, not covering their massive marketing efforts and other outsourced activities. So they're kind of hemorrhaging money right now. Also, while we're on the subject of like the ships, there's a lot of people that 
right now still think that there will be a gray market where if you buy these special edition ships, eventually they're going to be worth more than the money that you paid for them. So they're kind of expecting appreciation on the value of them. They're calling it a gray market where they'll be able to sell them on eBay for over like a thousand dollars or things like that for basically just special edition ships. There's also a weird cottage YouTube industry where people will go out and buy these ships and do very, very detailed tours of them, like 45 minutes to an hour just touring some of these ships and showing you all the different levels. Like I was looking at one that was uh, like an 85 minute video on the new $3,000 yacht that has like a complete spa, has like all the crew quarters, has just hundreds of features. And like that attention to detail is amazing, but once again, you'll never get to use it. And I want to remind everyone, this all started with the Kickstarter aiming to get $500,000. And now that they're 600 times their goal, it still has not come out. Do you think At it would have come out by now if they'd just gotten the 500000 If they'd just gotten 500000 to like maybe a million, I think that they would have put something out and we might have gotten a bare bones fun thing to play. But the thing is, there are other games like this, like Elite Dangerous is probably as close as we're going to get to this, and they had some issues with their launch, not as much as No Man's Sky, but that's a game that people really enjoy, although I hear that the learning curve at the very beginning is even harder than I uh, than Star Citizen. Like, it takes a while, like a lot of people don't even figure out how to get their ship out of the station before they give up on the game. Yowza. But the overall game, like once you actually learn all this, is supposed to be fun. Sometimes I think these star simulators don't realize that you just need to be able to hop in your ship and go and have some fun. Like that's what No, no Man's Sky did that pretty well. You hit E and all of a sudden you're like in your ship and going. I think the cockpit navigation thing will take off if VR becomes widespread. That's well, a that place is one of I... the things that they did put that star, like, they, uh, one of the first things they did is, like, this will be fully VR capable. Like, we already partnered with Oculus and all this, and that was in 2012. So another uh, thing It's that a good idea, out. because if yes. you can actually reach down and flick switches and there's something like a tactile feedback to where things are on your console, in, like, in virtual space, compared to what you want to do. I think that's a lot better than having to click around or even have buttons to push on your keyboard. But it remains to be seen if VR will catch on like that. Yeah. And the new VR like quest system and a lot of other cool stuff makes me think that VR is getting closer. I don't know if it's ever going to really take off, but we're at a point where it's like, it's at a tipping point where it might, especially because there's some really fun games coming out for it. Prediction right think, now, the next Nintendo system that's a fully new system is just going to be VR. It sounds like uh, Apple has funded a bunch of patents on like an AR system that's going to get people closer to that, like a, a Google Glass type system. So we'll see if that has any influence on making this stuff become more of a reality. Could be. At this point, we are in a situation where weekly videos consist mostly of devs dodging questions about the current status of the game and tacking more features on. Stories of massive micromanagement have caused revision after revision after revision to harken back to the issues that plagued Duke Nukem forever. We've already seen engine and UI changes that have caused delays, and the longer the game sits, the more likely they are going to be facing doing this again just to keep up with modern technology. The game itself plays like a B-rated game with hilarious bugs and a community that shifts between ravenously defensive and trolling that seems to celebrate every delay, misstep, and mistake Cloud Imperium makes. And I can kind of understand like the cost-sunk fallacy that some of these people probably have for the game, but there's also people that have made a lot of investment that absolutely despise the game now. I can definitely see the people who are just enjoying how terribly this is going. There are... I... I, I can enjoy some of that in my own life from time to time just yeah. thinking like well this thing is falling apart let's see how that goes there is something hilarious about stepping out of a ship and watching it clip into a rock and then launch your ship 500 miles into the air and watching it explode while you're stranded on a planet yeah if only they if that was on purpose it'd be better i guess <laughs> i mean not that it would be broken but it, like you know you can just play just cause yeah <laughs> there, there are some very um, interesting things with the world that I've liked so far, too. Like, you'll see poor NPCs that don't have really good spaceships where they literally have, like, a weird bag respirator over their head and in crummy parts of cities and things like that. It's like they're trying so hard but can't get it out. 
All right. It's- From the outside, it seems like this game will go on to be the biggest bad idea in video game history. Debacles like those seen in No Man's Sky have been fixed and now have a thriving player base. Star Citizen seems to be on a never-ending mess that will hemorrhage money until it can no longer sell $3,000 ships to cover their overhead. At this point, it will most likely be sold off to the highest bidder or simply vanish, a shadow of what could have been. People have wanted this since they got into spreadsheet simulators like EVE Online. They wanted that deeper, comprehensive game, and I don't think Star Citizen is going to be the one to do this, unfortunately. I truly hope that in a year or two from now, I can post an apology podcast about how sometimes an idea just takes longer, but seven years into development, not even a simple end in sight, have me doubting that Star Citizen will ever turn that corner. And I think that's all we've got for today, Tony. Oh, I want to I want to give a special shout out to uh, our friend Phallic from uh, Mixer and on Twitch and our YouTube channel, who gave me an eighty five dollar ship from like whenever he bought a bunch of ships and was planning to use them as giveaways, and then it never materialized that he could ever like really stream it because they never released the game. So I have gotten to play this, and I just want to say thank you for uh, for letting me try it out without having to drop any of my own cash. That was awesome of you. So thank you, Phallic, and. Also, if you enjoyed this, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash human echoes. You can get pins, you can get early podcasts, you can get all sorts of fun stuff. We will talk to you guys next week with more bad ideas. Bye, guys.